Thank you very much, Professor Barrett. And, and thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here to support me and to, uh, to listen to me present, um, to give my capstone presentation. I'd like to start with a, an excerpt from the introduction to Leaving the Gabriel. In 1892, in a log cabin in the Rocky Hill country of Texas, a little girl was born. During her life, she would fall in love and marry, bear seven children, and suddenly find herself a young widow. She would raise those seven children through the Great Depression, and always looking for something better, she would move her family dozens of times. She would watch her son join the Army in a time of peace, and then she would turn on the radio and hear President Roosevelt give a speech that began yesterday, December 7, 1941. She would not know whether her son was alive or dead, and then she would write him letters and send them to the Zinsuzi prison camp in Japan. This piece is not about world events, though world events will make a fine backdrop. This piece is about cook pots, wash pots, floods, floods droughts, feast, famine, lots of family, and how one woman managed to raise seven children in a quickly changing world. Leaving the Gabriel is as you can see, the story of Lena Golson and her family. Lena Golson is my great-grandmother. I entitled it Leaving the Gabriel because one of the themes in, in the piece is um, the fact that this family, they, they had a, a family farm near the community of, 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 of Georgetown, which is north of Austin. And about six miles west of Georgetown, they had a family farm. Anyone who's familiar with the Georgetown area knows that it looks like this. And it's not really the place for a, for a farm. And so they spent much of their life trying to grow cotton and wheat and other things, um, trying to dig these things out of their, out of their fields. And so it was, uh, it, was, it was difficult. It was sandy soil, and they couldn't make much of a crop. So they would spend a few years on this family farm, and then, frustrated with the low returns, they would leave, go somewhere else, went to Oklahoma, the Texas Panhandle, South Texas. But invariably, well, almost invariably, they would end up going back to this family farm on the Gabriel River. And every time they left, they came back, except the last time. First, I would like to talk about why I chose this topic, why it's important to me, and, and why similar stories should be important to all of us. Afterwards, I'll discuss some of the challenges that I've encountered in telling this story. First, the challenges that are general anytime you try to write creative nonfiction. I know some people think creative nonfiction is a bit of an oxymoron. I'll talk about that as well. So some challenges are general anytime you try to tell a nonfiction narrative or what we might call a true story, anytime you try to write a true story. And then there, there are other challenges that are more particular to writing about family. I'll, I'll discuss some of those. And finally, I will, I will wrap up with some excerpts from Leaving the Gabriel, after which I'd love to take any questions. We are accustomed to thinking of history as the story of big people, great people, doing big, great things which affect huge numbers of people, nations, uh, the world. And in a sense, that's true. But there's a, there's a discipline known as people's history, which is described as a type of historical narrative which attempts to account for historical events from the perspective of common people rather than political or other leaders. And people's history argues that the driving factor of history is the daily life of ordinary people. Now, I'm a fan of history, and I think it's valuable to know about big, great people doing big, great things, but I think that where the rubber meets the road is people's history. So big people doing big things might be the causes, but I think the real story of history is how normal people were living their lives, how, how this 99% of the population was living their lives on a daily basis. Writing on the issue of bringing the voice of ordinary people into history, a professor from the University of New York, Dr. John Shedd, said the following. One of the most challenging problems faced by teachers of history is how to give voice to the vast majority of people who have lived in the past. Our knowledge of history tends to center on the great and important because we are tied to extant written records, almost all of which were produced by and or about people of high stature in society. For a long time, historians assumed that little people of days gone by would always remain silent to us since they left behind so few writings to examine. And among some European historians, at least, a bias in favor of the elite perspective was summed up in the phrase, the inarticulate masses, 
a phrase that was still in use as late as the 1990s. I think the most important point that Dr. Shedd makes is when he says we are tied to extant written records. And in truth, we can't really blame, we can't really be blamed for focusing on great people doing great things because those are the only things of which we had records to examine. So we are tied to extant written records. So in an effort to change that, organizations such as StoryCorps try to record events of regular, everyday people doing everyday things. Those of you who listen to NPR might be familiar with StoryCorps, and I'm a big fan of them. And what they do, they, they drive around pulling what looks like a, a big travel trailer, but inside this travel trailer, instead of living quarters, there are booths, sound booths. And you can go in with a friend or a family member and sit down and tell a story. And the story might be two minutes, three minutes, four minutes long. It doesn't have to be elaborate. And they record that story and they, and they, and they document it and, and hold on to it for future generations. And they describe themselves as an independent nonprofit whose mission is to provide Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs with the opportunity to record, share, and preserve the stories of our lives. We do this to remind one another of our shared humanity, strengthen and build the connections between people, teach the value of listening, and weave into the fabric of our culture the understanding that every life matters. At the same time, we will create an invaluable archive of American voices and wisdom for future generations. And I think that's a very, very noble cause. And participating in that, it, it was, it was in, in the hopes of participating in that cause that I wanted to write the story of, of Lena and her family. So, telling the story of everyday people is valuable. Why pick family? Now, Alex Haley, the author of Roots, said the following about family history. In all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. Without this enriching knowledge, there is a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments in life, there is still a vacuum, an emptiness, and the most disquieting loneliness. Alex Haley said that in Roots, and I think that's ab absolutely true. I've always loved family history. I've always found interest in family history. I grew up hearing my mom and dad and my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles tell stories, and I always loved them. Um, not only that, but I grew up seeing uh, records of my ancestors, when they were born, where they were born, so on and so forth, and I always found a great interest in it. However, and I didn't realize this until later, I realized one day that I always tended to think of family history in a vacuum. I didn't think of family history as having occurred, I didn't think of these stories as having occurred in the same world that I learned about in high school history class. It never occurred to me to make that connection. And so one, one of my goals in this project is to take the stories that I've heard all my life and to give them some context. Take a look at what was going on, not just in the four walls of the house of my great grandmother, but look at what was going on in the state at that time. Look at what was going on in the nation and in the world at that time and see how those events might have affected what was going on in the, wall, in the four walls of their home. So, why choose Lena? I chose to write about Lena because I think that she lived in what is arguably the most dynamic period yet in human history. When she was born in 1892, people got about on horses and in wagons as they had for centuries. And when she died 88 years later, there were human footprints on the moon. And I think that's that displays what a, what a huge change there was during those 88 years. And I, I don't know that, now I could be wrong, but I don't know that there will be that drastic of a difference in life 88 years from now as there was from the 1890s and the 1980s. So, obviously I had a number of family members that lived in that area. Why focus on Lena? Well, just as Dr. Shedd said, when we study history, we are tied to extant written records. Well, Lena Sawyer, left a stack of daily journals about this high. She wrote a brief memoir of her childhood, and four of her seven children also wrote brief memoirs of their childhood. So the only reason that we're talking about Lena Sawyer today is because she and her children put something down on paper. Lesson being, if you want to be remembered, make sure that you put something down on paper. Author Vivian Gornick, has told us that it's extremely important to understand the relationship between a writer and the topic about which he's writing. This is my relationship to Lena Sawyer. She is my mother's mother's mother. I'm Aaron Matthews. This is my mother, Judy, uh, used to be Scrobanek. Her mother is Margie Sawyer, who is Lena's daughter. 
and some of these names will become, become familiar to you as I, as I read excerpts from, from Leaving the Gabriel. Now I'd like to discuss some of the challenges to writing creative nonfiction. This is the plot diagram. We see it in elementary school. The, when we go to a movie, the movies we watch follow the plot diagram with very, very few exceptions. The children books, children's books we read follow the plot diagram. Ivanhoe follows the plot diagram. The Dukes of Hazard follow the, the plot diagram. Anytime you tell somebody, listen, I'm going to tell you a story, whether they realize it or not, they expect the plot diagram. That's how you tell a story. Real life, however, is messy. Maybe you have a car accident. Uh, maybe about the same time as you're progressing towards finishing your degree and you fall in love and get married and your dog dies and you're teaching your nephew to go fishing and all this happens as your career is progressing. And, or, maybe, or maybe you get fired. And so there are all these things happens, happening at once and it gets really, really messy. And the job of a writer of creative nonfiction is to, to again, borrow a, a turn of phrase from Vivian Gornick, to isolate the story, to, to look at all this, this confusing mess that is life and pull something out of there that's worth telling, to pull something out of there that's going to make people want to read something. That's isolating the story. And that's, that's often very difficult. Writing about family in particular has challenges of its own. The main challenge to writing about family is that you never know what is going to make someone uncomfortable. On the topic of writing about members of your family, a writer by the name of Philip Lopate, who's an expert in the genre of creative nonfiction, said the following. Many times I have decided to hold back from using juicy material which I thought would damage the reputation of the person in question or deeply offend him or her. Complicating the dilemma is that one does not always know what will cause offense. Now, in, in, writing, in writing Leaving the Gabriel, I didn't expect that I was going to come across anything incredibly juicy in the, in the story of, of my great-grandmother. Had I come across something incredibly juicy, it wouldn't have been difficult for me to set it aside to spare the feelings of, of my family. But just as, as Philip Lopate says, you never know what will cause, you never know what will cause offense. And that's very true. And in the course of preparing this project, I have learned exactly how true that is. Another difficulty in writing about family is determining your audience. When you sit down to, to write something about your family, you have to decide, is this something that's only going to be read by, by my children, by, by the family, or is this something that, that I'm going to try to, to, to hand out to a stranger and hope that he'll find interest in it? And what makes a big difference, what, what that really affects is what, what you leave in and what you, and what you take out. I'm going to read a quote from the short memoir that my great-grandmother, Lena, herself wrote about her childhood. She said, the children are always saying, meaning her children, why don't you write a book? They say the history of our family will make an interesting book, which could be said of any family. But no history of any kind is interesting without a good narrator, and that I know I'm not. By the way, I would disagree with her. That I know I'm not. I'll put down a few facts, though. The trouble is I don't know where to begin and what to put in and what to leave out. If I tried to write as I remember, it would make a library, always supposing I could really write as I remember. But memories never come as bidden. They just slip in unexpectedly. And that's true. And I think she hit the nail on the head when she said, the trouble is... I don't know what to put in and what to leave out. Now, if you're writing for your family, especially the genealogist in your family, they're going to want details. They're going to want date and place of birth and death and everything in between. They're going to want full proper names that are on the birth certificate. The general audience, on the other hand, is going to want the story. They're going to want to know the human interest items. They're not going to want to know the name that's on the birth certificate. They're, they're going to want to know the name somebody went by. They're not going to want to know, they're not going to want to know William Robert. They're going to want to know Billy Bob, for example. Now, this is a, a f the family tree of the, the story that, that is contained in, in Leaving the Gabriel. And I think the first thing we think, anytime we see a, a family tree that doesn't belong to us, is who cares? That, that's a lot of names and a lot of information, and, and who really cares? So if you're writing for a general audience, what you want to leave out is 
is details ad nauseum because nobody cares. At least the general audience doesn't care. In Leaving the Gabriel, this is what's important. Lena Golson married Jesse Sawyer, and they had seven children. And it, this is a story, essentially, of that family. And, and, the, and to provide some brief background, uh, there's also a, a brief background of Lena's family and also of Jesse's family. But at its core, Leaving the Gabriel is a story of Lena Golson and her family. Now, I would like to read a few excerpts from Leaving the Gabriel. And to set them up, the first excerpt, I'm going to read three. The first excerpt that I'm going to read takes place in 1899. Lena is still a child. She was born in 1892, so she's six or seven years old. Her family has gone, briefly gone to Oklahoma looking for a better life, decided they didn't like it, and they came home. They were there two years. They lost two children while they were there. So Lena has just recently lost two of her brothers, and they are returning home to the, the rocky hills of Williamson County and their farm on the Gabriel River. After arriving back in Williamson County, John and Laura did not move back into one of the houses on the family property, instead purchasing a farm a couple of miles away. After moving into the house, which happened to be perched atop a hill, John and Laura soon discovered why all the other houses in the area were built below the crest of the hill instead of on top of one. Being on top of the hill, their little frame house caught every gust of wind that blew through the area. The wind was more than just a minor nuisance. Laura was afraid the wind would literally blow the house down. Whether John shared her fear or was simply trying to be a good husband, he addressed Laura's concern. Starting in the fall of 1899, John took the frame house apart board by board, carried it to the bottom of the hill, and patiently reassembled it. The new side of their house was conveniently closer to the barn, which might have been more of a motivation for John than the opportunity to stay out of the wind. During the disassembly and reassembly, the family moved temporarily into a small log house located safely at the bottom of a hill. About the same time, the community started a Sunday school program for the children held in the schoolhouse, complete with a small organ and some small number of books. Sunday school was significant, not only because the little community on the Gabriel had no church, but also because it seems to be the first opportunity that Lena, and probably the rest of the children as well, had to be exposed to any quantity of books. Shelves were built especially for the books in the closet of the schoolhouse, just above the spot for the organ. Lena would recall later Sixty years later, Lena would recall what a novelty it was and what an enjoyment at seven years old to have this small library at her disposal. To contribute further to her education, Lena had the opportunity in May of 1900 to witness a near full eclipse of the sun. I would like to know if the Golsons knew if the eclipse was coming and to watch for it. I expect not, but I could certainly be wrong. Who knows what may have been in that small library of books. Lena later described the eclipse as, quote, the most complete eclipse I ever saw. It was like twilight, so dark that chickens, thinking it was already night, flew up to roost. While John was still working to complete the reassembly of the frame house, their temporary log cabin became a bit more overcrowded. In the heat of summer, July of 1900, Laura gave birth to a little girl. By Lena's account, her baby sister was a pretty baby with peaches and cream complexion blue eyes, and golden curls. They named her Florence. It is significant that Lena described her baby, her baby sister as pretty. She held the same opinion of her little brother Johnny, but not of herself. Quote, Johnny was a pretty child, and I wasn't. People always said, what a pretty little boy, or the boy is prettier than the girl. I don't remember caring that he was prettier, but it might have been the beginning of my inferiority complex that took me well into my adult years to overcome. Johnny always knew how old he was, his address, and various little things, like who the president was. I knew all that too, but it was cuter for him to tell it because he was smaller. But I had long, thick, wavy hair though, and sometimes I got compliments on that. When Florence was born, Lena was eight years old and Johnny was six and they were quite enamored of their new baby sister. In Lena's own words, I don't think Ma had any trouble getting our help to tend the baby. 
Summer being harvesting time, John was busy with the reaping and threshing of their crop of wheat, leaving Lena and Johnny, their mother's only help, at the house. Lena later wrote, Johnny and I had many chores helping Ma. We brought vegetables from the garden and helped repair them. We carried innumerable buckets of water from the spring and felt very important in the scheme of things. While Lena and Johnny were helping their mother do the chores and tend the new baby, John was harvesting what Lena would later describe as the best crop we ever had while we lived there. In addition to receiving a new child and a plentiful harvest, the Golsons soon moved out of their log cabin and back into their frame house, this time safely reassembled at the bottom of the hill. Less than two years later, the whole family would have reason to be grateful for the frame house's new location. In April of 1902, a terrible storm hit Williamson County. A fourth child, a real brunette, as Lena described her, named Laura Maud, had been born only two months before the storm. <clears throat> as hail pounded violently on the roof, John struggled with the door, fighting against the wind to keep it from swinging open and letting the storm inside. I can imagine John wondering, as the wind and hail pounded against the walls and the roof, if he shouldn't have put perhaps a nail or two more in each joint when he was building the house. But the door held along with the rest of John's construction, and his wife and four children remained safe and dry. When the storm subsided, <coughs> the family went outside to survey the damage. Looking across the river, they discovered that the, that the house of one of their neighbors had not fared as well as their own. During the storm, the neighbor's house had been completely unroofed, leaving the occupants, including two small boys and an infant girl, to be pounded by the hail and the wind. The family had sought shelter, wading through waist-deep water. Miraculously, the only injury was a sore spot on the head of one of the boys, he having been hit by a hailstone. Walking up the hill to the former site of their frame house, the Golsons found a sobering sight. A wide path of trees had been completely uprooted, plainly suggesting a tornado. Had John not taken the suggestion of his wife to take the house apart and rebuild at a safer location, Laura's fear that the family would be blown away would likely have proven well-founded. Later in life, Lena would recall going down to the Gabriel River with her mother when she was still very small. Mother Laura would fish while Lena and her little brother Johnny and later the other children played in the water, likely scaring away any fish that Laura might have caught. Lena recalled occasionally, though not often, seeing deer as they walked or bounded through the field. And if anyone cared to know the best place to find a possum in Williamson County, little Lena Golson could have told you to look in a persimmon tree. The Golsons left the area again in 1903 to live in the town of Granger, 30 miles to the east, where John worked for a local commercial farm peddling vegetables. I can only assume that their crops on the Gabriel were not reliable year after year as the Golsons would have liked them to be. But for whatever reasons the Golsons left, they did not stay long. They did not stay gone long. John's career in Granger as a vegetable peddler was short-lived, and in time for the birth of their final child, a daughter named Ruby, in 1905, the family had returned once again to their little community on the Gabriel River. Twice, John and, Laura's, John and Laura Golson's family left the Georgetown area, once to the Chickasaw Territory and once to Granger, and twice they came back. Each time the Golsons left, they seemed to be looking for material success, or maybe just a living. Each time they returned, they seemed to be looking for home. This lesson was not lost on the Golson children, who learned it well. In the years ahead, Lena and her siblings would grow and marry, and would each play a game of hide-and-seek with success, chasing bumper crops and good jobs over thousands of miles, mostly in different parts of Texas. But whether they were near Amarillo working in a cotton gin, or building a pipeline near Corpus Christi, it seems that home was always the rocky rolling hills of Williamson County and the meandering North Gabriel River. The next excerpt that I would like to read is after Lena has grown. She has married a man by the name of Jesse, Jesse Sawyer. The year is 1925. Jesse and Lena have already left the Gabriel a number of times and returned a number of times, and when this excerpt begins, they are in a town called Littlefield, in the Texas Panhandle, in the plains called the Llano Estacado. When Lena and Jesse had been in Littlefield for just over a year, like clockwork, 
they began looking for, for work and a life elsewhere. They were not successful in Bloomfield, at least not successful enough to stay. Perhaps Lena again assessed, as she had in the soggy cotton fields of South Texas several years before, that she and Jesse were, quote, doing no good, unquote, in Littlefield. But that explanation for leaving farm after farm, year after year, seems insufficient. Or maybe it's just a bit cryptic. Farming has always been a bit of a gamble each season. And farmers know this. As a manifestation of faith and hope, farmers plant their seeds in the spring. Sometimes the rain cooperates, and the frost and the weevils remain at bay, and there's a good crop in the summer. And then, sometimes there's not. For Lena and Jesse, doing good might have meant good soil, good rains, good crops, and good prices. Of course, Lena and Jesse hoped for all of these things each year. But I, don't, but I don't think that's what they were looking for each time they moved, or what was lacking each time Lena said they were doing no good. For tenant farmers in Texas, life in the early 20th century was hand to mouth. One economist estimated that by 1914, half of all tenant farmers borrowed 100% of their income, hoping to pay it back each year after the harvest. Lena and Jesse had the advantage over most tenant farmers of being able to return their breath. But judging from the number of times they moved elsewhere, agriculture on the Sawyer farm was simply not sustainable. By the mid-20s, the beloved orchard on the farm had dwindled into such poor condition that the trees were uprooted in favor of using the land for row cropping. A number of times, Jesse attempted, sometimes temporarily successfully, to secure employment outside the tenant farm, outside of tenant farm and ranch work, as a carpenter, a postal worker, in a cotton gin, and later on a petroleum pipeline. I tend to think that with every move, Lena and Jesse hoped not only that their next crop would be plentiful, but, that would, that, but also that some unexpected door would open out of tenant farming and that their next crop would be their last. Looking to leave Littlefield, Lena, Jesse and Lena became aware of a farm in need of, of tenants outside the town of Arch, New Mexico. Of all the times that Lena, Jesse and Lena would move during their life together, this is the only move that ever carried them outside of Texas. The fact that their destination was in another state, though, was a technicality. It was only 60 miles from Littlefield. When the spring came, Jesse and Lena vacated their four-room farmhouse before their new home in Arch was available. In the interim, the only available accommodation they could find was a one-room dugout shelter close to Littlefield. The dugout being too small for all seven Sawyers, Lena and Jesse pitched a tent next to the dugout. Lena, Jesse, and the baby slept in the dugout itself, while the four older children slept in the tent. One night, a stray cat wandered up and let Jesse stroke its fur. Seeing the opportunity to both entertain and educate their children, Jesse took the stray cat into the dark tent and showed the children how tiny static electricity sparks fly between the cat's fur and their daddy's hand. Though Jesse and Lena had owned an automobile for part of the time they had lived in Littleton, they had sold it before time to leave for New Mexico. And so, just as they had once traveled to South Texas, Jesse and Lena loaded their possessions and children into wagons for the short journey to the new farm in Arch, New Mexico. The family arrived in Arch and settled into their three-room house just in time for the older children to attend a few weeks of school before summer break. Arch was small. The town itself consisted of nothing more than a schoolhouse and one other building which doubled as a post office and a store. But conveniently for the school-aged children, the farm on which they lived in Arch was much less remote than any of their previous homes. Tom, who was 10 years old at, at the time of the move to Arch, later described the house as follows. We lived on a farm about one and a half miles west of Arch in a three-room frame house located about 100 yards back from the main road with large cottonwood and locust trees. The land was sandy and the pasture land was covered with purple sage which grew to a height of three or four feet. It was very beautiful when in bloom. Margie, who was nearly a teenager when they lived in New Mexico, would come to love Arch more than any of their, their other temporary homes. And she said the following. The ice and snow were a joy to the children, if not to our elders. 
The apple orchards delighted us. There had never been so much fruit in the house before. The peanut crop was abundant, and they were roasted by the gallons. Often at night, the family sat in the kitchen, making and eating peanut brittle, and sometimes friends joined us there. Cherries were found to be something that grew on trees and not bought in bottles or cans. A neighbor had a vineyard which produced grapes, sweet beyond belief. The same neighbor had a big cement tank supplied with water by a windmill and full of catfish. There was also a smaller dirt tank in which swam goldfish, large and small, and on which we played when it was frozen over. No one had skates, but that didn't stop the fun. We ran, slid, and fell, and no one broke a limb. When school started in the fall of 1926, five-year-old Heaney was not quite old enough to attend. It happened, though, that the school at Arch had by some miscalculation hired three teachers, more than, they would, be, more than would be needed for the expected number of students. Due to the extra resources, Families in the community were invited and encouraged to send their five-year-olds to school. Lena seems to have objected initially, but since Teenie would be accompanied by her three older siblings, Margie, Tom, and Bunt, Lena relented and allowed Teenie to attend school. Even for a five-year-old, though, Teenie was small. Her siblings were admonished to not let Teenie blow away with the tumbleweeds as they walked into town each day. But had Teenie not been allowed to attend school, she would still have been more educated than most five-year-old daughters of prairie tenant farmers. To the extent that books were available, Lena read with the children and taught them to do so for themselves. Teenie recalled occasionally coming to a word that she could not identify. She would spell the word to her, the difficult word to her mother, who was, while Lena was likely engaged in some other work of the house, farm, or family, Lena would tell her how to pronounce it and Teenie would continue on. On the topic of the family's success while in Arch, the Sawyer children differ in their recollection. Tom later remembered a bumper crop, just teeny, while Teeny seems to recall that it was a lean year. Regardless of which is more accurate, Lena, Jesse, and their five children stayed in Arch no longer than they stayed at any, at any other tenant farm. Margie later recalled the following about December of 1926. Snow came for the Christmas program at school but for most of the family, the holiday was saddened by the fact that another move had been planned, end of quote. But in this case, the move was unavoidable. Regardless of the good friends, fresh produce, and catfish ponds available in Arch, word had arrived from Lena's brother Johnny near Jackson County in South Texas that work might be available in the oil fields near the town of Refurio. Allure, allured strongly by the possibility of work outside of tenant farming, Jesse and Lena made the decision to go. In a great demonstration of faith in their impending career move, Jesse and Lena traded all of their livestock for a Model T Ford. With the winter wind blowing at them from across the Llano Estacado, Lena and Jesse made their five children as comfortable as possible, loaded them into the truck, and then drove away from the farm at Arch, New Mexico in January of 1927. And the final excerpt that I would like to read it takes place only a short time later once they were in South Texas. Jesse had indeed secured work working in the oil industry. He was helping build a pipeline instead of working in the oil fields. For a while they had struggled because the only work that he could find was about 40 miles away from where they lived so they only saw Jesse on the weekends. After a few months in Refurio, Lena and Jesse were finally able to find a house in Taft just before school started in the fall. The house wasn't quite as convenient to town as they might have liked. It was about a mile out, but at least it was in Taft, which meant Jesse could once again come home to Lena and the children every night, which Jesse did all through the fall. I expect the fall of 1927 was a joyous time for Lena and Jesse's family. After 14 years of marriage, living and working as tenant farmers, they had finally managed to find a door to something different and something they hoped would be better. Jesse's work in the oil field was hard, but it was steady. After having been away from Lena's family for eight years, Lena and Jesse now once again lived close to Lena's mother and sisters in Jackson County, and surely saw them often. And in a change from the summer, Jesse was now home every night. And as if joy begat joy, Lena and Jesse learned sometime in the fall that they would have another child in the spring. At some point in the fall, Lena, 
The six-year-old Teeny became sick with what the doctors thought was typhoid, followed by three-year-old Benny. Teeny was feverish and listless, but little Benny was more severe. She was unable to eat, and the, doctors treating, and the doctor treating her insisted that she be fed through a tube inserted into her nose. Under any circumstances, caring for two sick children would be a task, but Lena was not well either. About the same time, she began having morning sickness. And so, after working all day on the pipeline, often in the cold rain, Jesse would come home and spend the evening and night nursing his ailing family. But by December, Jesse too had fallen ill, soon followed by 11-year-old Tom. Typhoid fever usually progresses over a matter of weeks. The high fever and listlessness described by the Sawyer children were typical of the illness and were probably accompanied by profuse sweating, a skin rash, and severe intestinal problems. Jesse was soon the sickest of the family. He had likely been sick for some time before he began resting and receiving treatment. Teeny recalls that after becoming ill, Jesse went outside to chop wood for the wood, for the wood burning stove despite his illness. Of course, that comes as no surprise. Loving parents, as Jesse certainly was, always tend to place the care of their family above their own well being. But Jesse's condition deteriorated quickly, and Lena soon sent word of the illness to Jesse's family. In response, Jesse's mother, Sarah, and his younger brother, Earl, came immediately. Sarah and Earl took care of the, took the, care of the family into their hands, tending to two healthy children and three sick, in addition to ailing Lena and critical Jesse. As doctors always do, they did what they could for all of the Sawyers. And des but despite their efforts, Jesse continued to worsen. Jesse died on a Sunday morning in December. The doctors disagreed on exactly what had caused his death. One said it was typhoid, another said pneumonia. Margie, who was 13 years old at the time, was of the opinion that the doctors were probably both right. Not that the cause of death made any difference. The weight of the world had just settled onto Lena's two shoulders. Did the medical details matter? After struggling side by side th through 14 years together, it was suddenly Lena's lot to struggle alone. They had spent those 14 years, years looking for something better than what they had, but at least they had always had. They had been poor for 14 years, but they had never been destitute. If nothing else, they had had Jesse's strong back and arms and his ability to plant a seed and make it grow. Jesse's sudden death at the age of 38 left Lena, a 35-year-old widow, with little money, five children under the age of 13, and a sixth on the way. What immense strength it took at that moment simply to remain upright. And yet, Lena did. Before Jesse's death, he rose every morning despite his terrible sickness and went about building a pipeline and chopping the family's cooking wood. And after Jesse's death, Lena rose every morning despite her terrible grief and raised five children who missed their daddy nearly as much as Lena did. Both Jesse and Lena loved their children dearly, and they knew that parents don't have the luxury of self-pity, even in times of terrible sickness or grief when they so greatly deserve it, simply because caring for their children is more important. By late January, the children were healthy, though Lena continued to struggle. Now that the immediate danger of the children's illnesses had passed, Lena began to think more of the need that she now faced to provide and care for the children. Knowing that she would need the support of her extended family, Lena moved with her children 70 miles north to the town of Fannin, where she could be close to her sister and her husband. Three months after arriving in Fannin, Lena gave birth to a sixth child. Several minutes later, she gave birth to a seventh. Twins were, of course, a surprise to Lena and to everyone else.